Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome in to our midweek study. Hope you're well and uh, that the warmer temperatures and the sunshine is doing you well, doing you good. Uh, I think it's help, probably helping us all out. But um, <clears throat> we are looking forward to spring and continued improvement in our situation and for those things that God has in store for us. And uh, hope you're able to be a part of all those things. So we're starting a new study this evening. I, I anticipate it for the last three sessions. Um, just entitled it, What's in a Psalm? And really, we're just going to look at one one psalm, uh, not only for the value of that particular psalm, but uh, also just to give you an idea of, you know, uh, the kind of things you might expect in a psalm and the great depth and, and meaning and relevance of the psalm uh, to us as believers. And so that's, that's what we're going to do, uh, Lord willing, for a few weeks. So what, what is in a psalm? We're going to look at the 50th psalm. may seem like an unlikely candidate. There are a lot more famous psalms than the 50th, but there's some great material in Psalm number 50. And so that's, uh, that's what we're going to do. And uh, I'm going to try and look at it sort of in depth <coughs> over, over this time. There are 23 verses in the 50th Psalm. And um, hopefully we will see, in answer to our question, what's in a Psalm? We will see a lot. Um, there's a lot in these Psalms and a lot of really important stuff for us. So I want to begin uh, in a logical way by reading the Psalm together. Um, take a, a couple of minutes. It's 23 verses long. Then we'll just make some notes about it and um, get into the first part of it uh, for this week. But um, let's let's ask God's blessings on our study, and then we will read through the 50th Psalm. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Again, um, you've been so good to us today. You provided those things we need. We we pray for faith and, and knowledge of you and more devotion to you. And please encourage us through your word tonight as we look at one of the great songs in your book. And may we see those things that you want us to see and then live them out. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Pray your blessings on all those who are a part of our study this evening or whenever they're able to be a part of it. Please take care of them and build them up. And uh, thank you for hearing us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the 50th Psalm. I'm going to be reading from uh, the English Standard Version, which is my go-to English translation. Uh, but really, any of them would, would work okay on this. And we may read a different one next week uh, when we go through this. Psalm 50 begins this way. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him, a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Verse 7, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house 
or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked... God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this, then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart, and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. All right, so that is, again, the 50th Psalm. And uh, again, our study is what's in a psalm. And so just making a couple notes about some upfront basics. You know, uh, there's some parts of that that might be on the page if you're looking at your Bible that I didn't read. For instance... Uh, before verse 1, where it says, um, you know, where it begins, the mighty one. Uh, before that, it says a psalm of Asaph. That's a, that's a title that many of the psalms have these titles that might say who composed them or things like that. Those titles are not original. Uh, they're not as ancient as the original text. Uh, sometimes they might be helpful, um, but uh, that's why they really shouldn't be included in the verse numbering, and um, they're they're not part of the uh, what we would think of as the original inspired text. So that's why I didn't read that portion. And then, if you notice out in the margin, from uh, excuse me, I've got a spam call coming in. Out in the margin from verse six, you might see a little word in in italics, um, S-E-L-A-H, Sela. Uh, that's, that's another uh, word that's probably not part of the original text. It likely was added later. Uh, we're not sure what that is. It might be sort of a musical notation, um, understanding that the, the Psalms were sung, uh, that they were uh, works of, of poetry and perhaps had um, musical accompaniment. Some people think sila means at this point the singer should raise his voice, um, but we really don't know for sure. Uh, so that's why when I read the Psalms uh, aloud to people, I don't read that portion. Uh, but that's that's another little note on the text itself. Now, this particular psalm, uh, the 23 verses, can really be divided into three parts. And that's sort of the, the way we'll approach our study of it. Uh, this week, we'll look at part one. Uh, but the three parts are, if you want to do a basic outline, verses one through six go together. And then verses seven through through 15 and then verses 16 through 23. Those are the three portions of this psalm, and we'll sort of look at each one in order over the course of, of these, uh, these studies. So verse 1 through 6, 7 through 15, and 16 through 23. As, as we look at the psalm as a whole, it seems to be a judgment scene. 
that is being uh, depicted or, or maybe the judgment, okay? And um, maybe you can think of other places where we get that kind of thing in Scripture. For, for Christians, probably the most famous is um, one that Jesus develops and, and tells about. You remember in Gospel of Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25 and... Um, really the last part of that chapter, beginning at verse 31, um, we have Jesus, uh, he's told a couple of parables in Matthew 25, and then he comes to this last part, and he says uh, in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and we'll notice the same kind of thing at the beginning of Psalm 50, God coming in glory, okay, but here in Matthew 25, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. You'll notice in Psalm 50, God calling all the nations to this scene, which seems to be a judgment scene. And then the Lord says, And he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and then he begins speaking to the two different groups so he's called all the nations together to a judgment scene he's sitting on his throne to judge them and he divides them into sheep and goats lost and found or lost and saved i'm sorry uh lost and saved so the picture is a little different in psalm 50 uh, but I think it's similar in the sense that it's depicting the judgment scene. It's just described differently in the two places. Uh, it's not quite as neatly divided uh, in Psalm 50 as it is in Matthew 25, when the Lord uh, describes what judgment will be like. Both of them, of course, are pictures. Um, they're not necessarily, this is exactly literally what's going to happen. Um, but they're pictures of the kind of thing that is going to take place. So Psalm 50 is a is the judgment judgment scene, and we see parallels to that in other places in Scripture. Uh, verses one through six, just quick overview here of the entire Psalm. Verses one through six again, they go together. It's sort of the prelude to the judgment, and in these verses, God shows up with great power. And we'll notice the details of that here in a moment. So we have that prelude to the judgment. And then in verses 7 through 15, it seems that God is addressing his covenant people. Uh, he's addressing, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, it, the sense would be he's addressing Israel, his covenant people. Um, and then in verses 16 through 23, he turns to the wicked, he calls them the wicked in verse 16, but to the wicked, God says. Now, there's some disagreement about, does that mean the wicked people of Israel who aren't keeping the covenant, or does it mean the rest of the world as opposed to the people of God? Uh, I tend to go with the latter, but I've noticed as I've um, read different comments on this, a lot of people think, they're all Israel, uh, but one is sort of the faithful group and the unfaithful group. Either could be true. And I think we'll get the same point either way. Uh, but but that's sort of a debate that goes on with this psalm. And we'll, we see that uh, as we study psalms and other portions of Scripture, different views. Um, but really, they come out the same place in the end. So a prelude, which we'll, we're going to take a moment and, and search through here. And then an address to uh, God's people, people that are in covenant with him, that are worshiping him. And finally, uh, an address to the wicked, whether it is unfaithful Israelites or the rest of the world. Uh, could be either one. And one more note before we uh, look at the, the opening part here. And that's just something for you to, to keep in mind, maybe underline in your study. I think the key verse 
uh, in the entire psalm is verse 21. Um, verse 21 where it says, These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Uh, that that phrase in there where God says, You you thought I was one like yourself. Um, that is, I think, a key to understanding the whole thing and how it goes together. You might remember the original temptation in the garden um, to Adam and Eve the serpent said to them, if you do what I say, um, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Uh, you shall be like God. That was the temptation, you see. And here God says to these people on this judgment, uh, in this judgment psalm, his, his criticism of them is they, they thought that, that he, God, was like them. So that is a, a basic a basic problem that's addressed. And then also another temptation, you might remember Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, right? As his ministry, public ministry is kick, kicking off, was very similar. If you go back and read the temptations, in essence, Satan was um, giving Jesus shortcuts, um, wanting... Jesus to substitute his will for the Father's will and so forth. It's a very similar kind of, of temptation. So we see this uh, throughout Scripture from beginning to end. All right. So that's just some things to note on, on the text itself and the way it's organized and, and uh, can be outlined. And one of the key uh Key points, verse 21, I think will really help us in understanding the whole thing. I think it's a key to the psalm, verse 21. But let's look at the beginning, uh, what uh, we call the prelude to the judgment. It's basically verses 1 through 6, and it starts um, with this. Uh, the ESV says, the mighty one God, the Lord. It's interesting in the original language, it, you have three straight names. It's uh, in Hebrew, El, Elohim, and then Yahweh. And usually you don't see uh, the names of God stacked together like that. Um, but we would translate it something like, um, they translate it the Mighty One, God, the Lord. We might say something like Father, Yahweh, God, um, but just there, there's th there's three names uh, stacked back back to back there, um, describing the subject and the voice of this psalm. And it says that that this one, the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. So he's calling all the earth together to the judgment uh, from the rising of the sun to its setting. So it's sort of like from east to west. It includes the entire earth. He's calling them all to account. And then it sort of gives the, the location of, of the Lord when he does this out of Zion. Zion, remember, is uh, literally, it's a hill uh, in, in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. But in the Psalms and in Old Testament poetry. It's sort of the realm of God, the abode of God. Um, and so uh, the place God is out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. So you get the picture of, uh, of, of this uh, beautiful scene, powerful scene, and God is uh, brilliant and bright and cannot be ignored. And then verse 3 says, Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Uh, that's important because in our key verse, which we named verse 21, remember God said, These things you have done, and he's just made sort of a list of their sins. These things you have done, and I have been silent. So sometimes God is silent for a period of time, 
And some people interpret his silence as that he doesn't care, doesn't really, isn't really concerned with what we do, how we conduct ourselves. And that's when God follows that up with, you thought, because of my silence, you thought that I was like you. And then he corrects them on that. He rebukes them. Well, here uh, at the beginning of the psalm, God's sort of calling the world to the judgment scene at Zion. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. God is done with the silence. Uh, and I think of like uh, the the final judgment, you know, um, how many people are going to be so totally shocked when God shows up? Uh, we're all going to be surprised um, because we're not going to know exactly when it's coming. We know his coming is sudden and um, it's like birth pain pangs coming on a woman is the way Jesus describes it. Um, it's not something you can uh, figure out exactly when it's going to happen. It comes suddenly. Uh, but how many in the world who have assumed God does not exist or isn't involved and doesn't care, how many are going to be so totally shocked when God comes and demonstrates that he no longer will be silent? And what's it like when God comes? It's always good to think about what your picture of God is. Um, I think in our time, the tendency, if people have a picture of God, is to want to picture him as a friend, almost a buddy. Um, and I'm not totally criticizing that, um, because we certainly see God calls people his friend and so forth. Uh, but, but look what it's like when he comes for judgment in verse 3. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. So he's making noise. <laughs> Before him is a dev devouring fire and around him a mighty tempest. Um, elsewhere in scripture, our God is a consuming fire. Uh, he is not in that sense, our buddy. He is not like us. And he is God. And when he comes, things burn up and are blown down and it's bright and it's loud and it can't be missed and it will not be ignored, you see. Um, it is an awesome thing when God comes. And then verse 4, what does he do? He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. It's almost like he's calling his witnesses. So he calls heaven and earth to witness this judgment. You see, he's in control of all of it. Not just the people he's created, but heaven and earth which he made. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. They're going to be sort of the jury box, figuratively speaking, poetically speaking here. And he says further to them, he says to heaven and earth, he commands heaven and earth, you see, because he made them. Uh, what were the things that Jesus did that most amazed his disciples? You remember when he calmed the storm? And the disciples, when, when Jesus calmed the storm, what was their reaction? Were they high-fiving one another or sort of sitting back and saying, that was neat? Scripture says they were afraid. Who is this person in the boat with us who commands the winds and the waves and they obey? Who is this? He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And he says, Verse 5, gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So here's this first group um, that are going to be addressed mostly in verses 7 through 15. God's faithful ones. That is, those who are in a covenant relationship with him. Old Testament context, we would think Israel. New Testament context, we would think the new Israel, uh, the people of God, uh, 
followers of, of Christ, that kind of thing. All right, so that's the first group. Both groups are being addressed in judgment. It's not like he doesn't have something to say and pretty strongly to his faithful ones. He most certainly does. And that's what we're going to see next time. What does he have to say to the ones he calls my faithful ones? Now, I would hope we would, all of us would include ourselves in that category now, you see, as worshipers of God, as followers of his son Jesus, that we would be his faithful ones. Does God have anything to say to us in judgment? God says, gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. All right? So, uh, Old Testament Israel, um, the temple worship and, and the sacrifices and so forth that, that were prescribed by, by Moses, um, that was a sign of their covenant, their, their relationship between God and Israel. So, he is shown up in fire and storm, sort of shaking the heavens, he, shining brightly forth from Zion, the Mighty One, God the Lord, Yahweh God. He speaks and summons the earth. He calls heaven and earth to sort of witness it. And then he says, bring me my faithful ones, those who make a covenant with me by sacrifice. And then verse 6, the last part of this first section. The heavens declare his righteousness. For God himself is judge. I, I was trying to sort of parallel it with uh, a modern court scene. You know, what happens when court is in session in, in our system? Uh, I think it still happens that when, when the judge walks in, everybody's supposed to stand. Uh, the bailiff says, the, the honorable judge, whoever... Um, and everybody stands, and then after the judge is seated, the, the audience sits. This is a similar kind of thing, except it's, it's not uh, a bailiff, a human bailiff. Uh, it's the heavens itself declare the righteousness of this judge. God himself is judge, and he is righteous. And so then God is going to turn uh, in verses 7 through 15, to, to these faithful ones, these people who are, you know, they're bringing their worship to the temple, in our context, uh, to our assembly. When, when we assemble to worship God, he's going to have something to say to these people. They've got a distinct misimpression of what's going on when they worship God, and God's going to try and correct them. And I wonder if, if we have that or something similar to it as as worshipers today, there's a reason this psalm was preserved and um, and God saw to it that we continue to have it. Do we have any of the, this tendency that he's going to criticize them for, uh, even in 2021? So I encourage you for next time just to you know, review that first part again, this, this scene of God showing up and starting this process, but then verses 7 through 15, what is God going to say to his faithful worshipers? Uh, what is the problem that has developed with their worship? What misunderstanding um, or, or wrong practice have they gotten into? And is it anything like what happens with worshipers of God today? So that will be session number two, uh, verses 7 through 15, and then the following time we'll look at what he says to, to the wicked. All right? So what's in a psalm? Well, I hope we're starting to see a lot. A lot is in a psalm. And um, they're, they're worthy of close study. And uh, in this first section, I, I think we're just supposed to be impressed um, by the power and majesty of of our God, who is a righteous judge. And yes, it's good to feel close and to, to call him Father and um, that kind of thing, but he, he is not like us. 
you know, when we walk into a room, uh, we don't bring usually a bright light and fire and earthquake and all those things that happen when God shows up. Uh, he is something other than us. And uh, I think we're supposed to be impressed by that. And the last thing uh, that's said of him there, he is a, a righteous judge. So whatever transpires in this judgment scene, we'll, we know it's going to be right because he is the righteous judge of all the earth. All right. So next time we will pick up again at verse 7 and look at part 2 of this. I hope you'll uh, be thinking about this and, and check back in with us next Wednesday night if we're able to do it next Wednesday night, Lord willing. Uh, pray you have a great rest of your week and hope uh, we can see many of you on Sunday either uh, in the assembly here or, or through uh, our live stream. God bless you. We'll see you soon.